Please remain standing if you're able to for the reading of the Word of God this morning. Today as we continue in our series in the Gospel of Matthew, we'll begin the message by looking at the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5 verse 3 through 12, the Word of God says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we praise you this morning as your church. God, we give you glory that this morning we have the honor and the privilege of standing before you and to worship you. God, to see our children sing songs, to see you speak, to see your word touch our hearts. Father, this morning we welcome your presence right here. Whether it's in our homes watching live right now, whether for those of us here, God, we ask that you would move that your spirit would touch every heart, that your word that we read would penetrate the depths of our existence so that we would be transformed today by you. Allow your word to speak clearly to each and every one of us. In your holy name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing this morning? This side is doing good. This side, not so much. Let's try this one more time. How's everybody this morning? Good, that was better. Hey, welcome guys this morning. Glad to have you with us, Church Online. It's good to have you with us too. I, I want to, you know, the thing that God has laid in my heart this morning to begin with really is this. And some of you may not agree with me on this, but uh, I, I think we got to be thankful this morning of how blessed we are to be able to worship today in a church to worship Jesus together because some of you may not understand this but the time may come and I have lived through this the time may come where you're not allowed to worship Jesus publicly and you should be prepared for that but at the same time you should celebrate the time that we have to worship together Jesus freely this morning so with that said today as we continue in our series called um, foundations looking at the gospel of Matthew this morning we're going to camp on gospel of Matthew chapter 5 if you want to open your Bibles if you don't have a Bible, there's some in the back. If, if you want to use your cell phones, please silence your cell phones. But we're going to look at verses 1 through 16. It's going to be the whole, whole day is going to be spent on these verses here today. But before we really get started, I want to share a story with you, a true story that happened when I was a kid. However, if you ask me, Nasser, can you prove this story? I wouldn't be able to prove it for you. I tried to look online for some details about it, but it didn't happen in this country. And it was before the age of technology was really advanced. But I thought, you know what? If you can watch Fox News or MSNBC and believe what they say, you, they say you are safe in believing what I'm about to share with you this morning, okay? When I was a child living in Iran, um, back then, I had not seen... A lighter until I was probably six or seven years old. A lighter where you with fire, you know. Uh, we used to use matchboxes. Anybody else as a kid who used matchboxes all the time? Yeah, there's a lot of us. We used to. I, we used to always use matchboxes as a kid. I loved matchboxes because you know you just see the fire come out. It's amazing. Um, but I, I loved matchboxes and and as a kid. My mom, when I was a kid, my mom had to use, we didn't have a lighter at home. My mom used to, cooking three times a day, making tea during the day to just have fire. You had to use matchboxes. So everybody used matchboxes. During the year, millions of matchboxes were sold. And there was this particular company in Iran that was making these matchboxes. And every matchbox had 30 matches in it. But one day, apparently, the owner of the company decided that if he removes one match from the box, yet sells it as a box that contains 30, he could make millions more. And by doing that, he could become wealthy and live a really good life. And he did that for a while, and he sold millions upon millions of matchboxes, and he made so much money until 
what he did came out on the news. And he was arrested for it. He got in trouble for it. And what he thought was creating comfort for him turned out to be a curse. And the reason I wanted to start with this is because in the realm of 30 matches, what is one match? In the realm of all the good things that you can do for God, what is one mistake? In the realm of all the amazing things that your life has to offer to God, what is one bad decision? And this morning, that's what we're going to look at as we look at the Gospel of Matthew. And my hope is that as God speaks to you, you will see that even one thing that you would withhold from God or rob from God would matter. Okay? With that said, i got to give you a disclaimer. This morning's message may be not the most exciting sermon you hear, okay? Some of you may consider it boring and you wish that, I wish I could go home and take a nap. And here's the thing, I could preach a really exciting message, but you would go home and you would forget all about it. But just reading these words by itself, just talking about them extensively and dissecting them, I believe will penetrate your hearts if you allow God to speak to you. So don't look at it from a perspective of, I have come to get something, but look at it as to what God can do this morning to me, okay? With that said, in seminary, they, they have multiple classes um, de designated or called with titles such as Christian ethics or ethics within Christianity, kingdom ethics, things like that. And most of the ethics or ethicists in Christianity to, who study Christian morality based all their foundations on the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is teaching the, princip the principles of Christian faith. And, and the interesting thing about it is that we are, we are going to work our way kind of backwards, as, uh, backwards and forwards before we come to the meat of what we're going to talk about. We're going to look at these 16 verses, but first we're going to look at behind the scenes, and then we're going to look at why Jesus said what he said, and then we're going to dissect these verses 3 through 12, okay? Everybody still with me this morning? Okay, so in chapter 3, which we talked about last week, in chapter 3, Jesus begins the process of his ministry, and in chapter 3, Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist, and the scripture says as soon as he was baptized, in chapter 4, as soon as he was baptized, the Spirit of God took Jesus to be tested by the devil, to be tempted by Satan, and I say this is off topic, but I say this to people who are being baptized usually, and we have it next week, okay? I always say this to people, I say, don't think just because you're about to be baptized or you're getting baptized that the enemy is going to leave you alone. No. No, he's just going to be really more upset that he has lost somebody, so he's going to try to get you back as hard as he can, okay? So Jesus is tested by the devil, and Jesus overcomes the power of Satan by the word of God. And then he says in chapter 4, Jesus began to collect his disciples and gather disciples for himself. He started his ministry, and he says at the end of chapter 4 that crowds, multitudes of people gathered to find healing, and Jesus healed their sick and the ill people that they brought and here's the interesting thing. Multitudes of people gathered because they wanted to get from Jesus what Jesus could give them. Rarely is it that people come to God to see what God can do in them and through them instead of what they can receive from God. And many of you came even this morning to church to see what, what God can do for you instead of coming to church to see what you can do for God. And I think that if you change that mentality, God will bless you this morning a lot more to see what can you do God in me, not for me necessarily. Okay, so then in chapter 5, verse 1, it says Jesus was with the crowds, and verse 1 says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. So at this point, Jesus is with the crowds, and he's kind of getting tired of these people who are just constantly coming, Hey, heal this person. Do this for me. Do that for me. And he kind of withdrew himself, and he sat down. And I love the ESV translation. I'm reading this morning from NIV, but the ESV says, He opened his mouth and began to teach. And his disciples gathered to listen to him. There are certain things that Jesus would not tell everybody. And this is important. Some of you are not going to like what I'm about to tell you right now in this second. There are certain jewels, certain pearls that Jesus is not going to just throw in front of the swine. Certain things that are just too precious. And I believe this portion of the scripture is like that. Can everybody read it? Yes. Not everybody is going to understand it fully. Why? Because it's meant for the disciples. Jesus sat down, and the disciples gathered to see what he has to say. But most of the times, people just gather to see, what can Jesus do for me? What can he do for me? Now, let's, let's look at it now. Before we get to the essence of what we're looking at, let's look at it as to why did Jesus say what he said. Verse 13 says, 
It says, you are the salt of the earth. So he's talking to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. If a salt is no longer salty and doesn't taste like salt, the only thing it is good at, good for, is to walk on. It's worthless. It's useless. And Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. And the thing is, most of us read a passage such as what we are about to read. And what we do with it is we think, oh, wait, this is a message of salvation probably. And here's what I want to tell you this morning. And some of you, again, may not like what I'm about to tell you to. Here it is, okay? These verses in particular, 3 to 12, that we're going to look at extensively, these are, this is not a message of salvation. Can it lead somebody to salvation? Of course. What we are about to read is a message for the saved. It's a message as to how the saved people must behave and act. And I tell you this, maybe some of you are watching online, maybe some of you are here today and you haven't made a decision about, you don't understand why Christianity is important. I tell you the reason why so many non-Christians have a hard time with Christianity is because Christians don't live out what we are about to read. Because this message for the saved is very, very important and we do not pay attention to it. And then Jesus says this, he says, you are, you are the light of the world, okay? See, I tell you every week, you never know what I'm going to pull out. You are the light. Let me plug it in, make sure it works, okay? Doesn't that look beautiful? You are the light. Let me read the, let me read the rest of this before we discuss about how beautiful that is, okay? Verse 14 says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds. They may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You are the light of the world. Isn't that beautiful? What is it missing? No light bulbs in it. What, what, I mean, how many of you would decorate your house for Christmas like that and invite people, hey, come see my house. It's beautiful. Look at it. It's horrible. And Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Yet I believe most Christians like, like, live like that. This is the way we look. We are the essence of the light, but the bulb is missing. That's what we look like. And that's why people have a hard time with Christianity. Because even the Christian doesn't live the way that Christians are supposed to live. And this is the message that Jesus really has for you. If you would open your Bibles again to Matthew chapter 5. Okay, verse 3 is where we're going to look at. And we're going to dissect these one verse at a time to understand what it looks like when Jesus said, Blessed are these people. Blessed are the people who are like this. Blessed are the people who are like that. We're going to dissect each one of them. And i got to be honest with you, okay? i got to be honest with you. When Jesus comes and says, blessed are the persecuted, blessed are the people who mourn, blessed are the people who, who are, are like this or like that, I don't feel blessed. I mean, when was the last time you mourned and you felt like, ah, oh, this feels so good? When was the last time somebody persecuted you or insulted you and said, my goodness, this is amazing. Can you do it again? <laughs> Blessed are the people who are like this. And Jesus comes and we're going to dissect what it really means and what Jesus is really saying. Because I think the reason why Christianity is suffering today is because we don't get it. And verse 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the people who are poor in spirit. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? Does it mean I need to have no money? Does it mean I need to be poor in the sense of the world? Does it mean that I can't be rich? I don't think that's what the scripture says. Blessed are the poor in the spirit. The word used in the Greek language to describe poor in this context is a very, very strong word. Very strong word that describes an extreme sense of poverty and oppression that leads somebody to become a beggar. This is very important. The word used here describes somebody who is poor in his spirit, which means a beggar in the spirit. Now, beggars, nobody looks at us and says, God, I'm, I feel blessed for being a beggar. But what Jesus is saying, blessed are the people who are beggars in the spirit, because if you are a beggar, you're only looking for certain individuals to provide for you. And in this case, a poor in the spirit is only looking at God for provision. Is only looking at God to be their source of provision. So if you're begging of God, you know that God is a good, generous God. And He provides everything that you need. Blessed are the poor in the spirit are the people 
who know and believe that God is the, their only source of provision. It's not their jobs. It's not their bank account. It's not their finances. God is the only one. And it's very important because what it says is theirs is the kingdom of heaven because the poorest person in the kingdom of heaven is still richer than the people on this earth. The poorest person has more spiritually than the wealthiest person on earth. And the next verse is, everybody still with me? The next verse says, blessed are those <laughs> who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And as I said, I, I, mean, I don't think there's anybody here who has ever lost somebody and says, I feel blessed this morning. I feel blessed for losing somebody. I feel blessed that I'm mourning. And here's the important thing. I don't think the kind of mourning that Jesus is talking about is what we understand as mourning. Now, we often associate the word mourn with the loss of something or somebody who is valuable to us. But this is not that kind of mourning. Can God comfort somebody who is mourning the death of somebody? Of course, He can. He's a comforter. He's a healer. But this mourning is a different kind of mourning. In fact, this is very similar to Isaiah chapter 6. If you have read Isaiah, the book of Isaiah is one of my favorite books in the Bible. Chapter 6 is my top favorite chapter in the Bible. And if you have not read it, I highly encourage you to read it. But it says Isaiah, the prophet, is before God in a vision. He's seeing God's throne in front of him. And he stands before the throne of God. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 5 says this. As he looks at God, he says, Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among the people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the king the lord almighty he says woe to me i cried this is the kind of mourning that jesus is talking about people who mourn for their sinfulness people who mourn for the sins of the other people woe to me i'm a man of unclean lips and i live among people who are unclean when was the last time you mourned for the sins of somebody when was the last time you mourned for your own sins or did you just say, it's okay, God will forgive me? See, this is what Jesus is talking about. Blessed are the people who mourn for their sins. Because they will be comforted. Because Jesus paid the penalty for their sins. But you still need to mourn for what you've done. You have still broken the heart of God. Your people have still, have still broken the heart of God. Blessed are the people who mourn. And this is in Isaiah. If you read it again later on your own, you see. It says, as Isaiah is mourning the sins of himself and the people, God's angel comes and puts a coal in his tongue and says, you have, been, you have been purified. You will be comforted. Verse 5 says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Let me come back to this, okay? Blessed are the meek. I love that word. So what was the first one? Blessed are the people who are what? Poor in spirit. Because they will inherit the kingdom of God. Those who rely on God. Blessed are the people who mourn the sins of everybody else. Because as they do, and their own sins, as they do, God will comfort them and they begin to shine. And then comes and says, blessed are the meek. The word translated for meek is an interesting word. It can literally mean humble, gentle, or meek. Some of these scholars look at this word and the etymology of it, the root of how the word was originated, and they believe, some of them believe that the word came from, the concept of the word came from domesticated strength, such as for a horse. They would use the word to describe horses that have become domesticated. They were wild horses. Why is, why is it so interesting? Because a wild horse that becomes gentle, becomes gentle to be ridden by the person who's riding it. Blessed are the meek are the people who were wild at some point, but now they're domesticated to be ridden or to be directed by God. Now, who is the one who rides that horse? The person who rides the horse decides what direction the horse goes. And Jesus says, blessed are the meek, the people who are allowing God to direct their path. And they're not saying, you know what? I know what to do myself. I'm better than this than you, God. Thank you very much. The next verse says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Is there anybody here who has never felt hungry or thirsty? Anybody? We all get hungry, don't we? I mean, this is amazing. We all get hungry. By the way, this is so off topic, but I got to tell you. So off topic. I was doing some research, and I discovered that, did you know that choking in America is the fourth leading cause of death 
It's crazy. It's more than suicide. More people die from choking in a year than they die from suicide. And, and most of the chokings happen because of eating food. That's crazy to me. See, more people die in a year than, than you would think from choking because everybody gets hungry. Because everybody gets thirsty. And the scripture says that people also get spiritually hungry and thirsty. And they don't know how to satisfy that. So they find other ways to satisfy their hunger and thirst spiritually. And in order to do it, see, the reason people choke on their food is because sometimes they get so hungry, it's just like, I gotta eat, I gotta eat, and they shove stuff in their mouth. And people do the same thing spiritually. They start shoving things in their spirit, in their soul, and worship things that don't matter. And they hunger and thirst. But Jesus says, blessed are the people who hunger and thirst for doing the things that are righteous, right things. The things that bring, bring people to the better understanding of God's goodness. Everybody still with me this morning? The next one says, blessed, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. What does it mean to be merciful? A merciful person is a person who shows mercy. What does it mean to show mercy? To show mercy, this is a very interesting word or concept. To show mercy means to withhold the punishment that somebody deserves. The people who show mercy are the people who withhold the punishment that somebody has done to you and they deserve it. And it's funny because Jesus says in the same way, Jesus says in the same way, you show mercy, God will show you mercy. In the same way you withhold punishment, God will withhold punishment from you. The next verse says, blessed are the pure in heart. And I love this one. The, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Now there are certain individuals, there are multiple facets to seeing God face to face. One of them, you like, one example of it is Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah is in a vision. He sees God face to face and he's looking at God. He says, woe to me, I am a ruined man because I'm unclean. And then you have the disciples right here who are, Jesus is sitting down. They're having a sit down with Jesus and Jesus, they're seeing God face to face. And then there's you and me. How do we see God face to face? Anybody can claim I've seen God? Here's the thing though. Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart because they do see God. They just, sometimes we're ignorant toward it. The pure in heart, this is important, the pure in heart, the reason they shine, the pure in heart, the reason they shine is because when they look at you, they see the face of God. When they look at me, when they look at each other, they see the face of God and they see how you were created in the image of the Almighty God. So in reality, everywhere they go, they see the face of God. How many of you have thought about that? How many of us have looked at other people as if they are God's image, created by Him for a purpose? As much as they annoy us sometimes, The next verse says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Peacemakers. I know when we read this verse, many of us think, you know what, I, I love to have peace in my house. Anybody like to have a peaceful house, peaceful work environment? But again, this is not the peace that Jesus is talking about. Of course, is it important for us to have a peaceful household? Of course, that's, that's scriptural too. But what Jesus is talking about is not the kind of peacemaking that you and I understand. This is the peacemaking of looking at people who, have, who bear the image of Christ and seeing the enmity they have with God and bringing reconciliation. This is the, the, the concept that Apostle Paul talks about in Romans chapter 5, verse 10. says, For a while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. How much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by His life? These are the people who stand in the gap and say, you know what? You were created in the image of God, but you don't know the love of God. Therefore, I must stand in the gap and bring you to reconciliation with God. You are the enemies of God, but God has come to bring peace between you and Himself. And I am the person who has to be in the middle of it. Blessed are the people who are peacemakers. Blessed are the people who are peacemakers, for they will begin to shine a light. Doesn't this look already much better? You're missing one light, though. And I'm going to combine the next two in one. The next verse says, Blessed are those who are persecuted 
because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the people who are persecuted. I got to be honest with you again here. I, as a former Muslim, I have been persecuted for my faith in different occasions. I've been insulted. People have called me a traitor. I've called me many things. And I've never once looked at it and said, man, that feels really good. Could you, could you say that one more time? What, traitor? That sounds really nice. I have never looked at it in that sense. But Jesus comes and says, blessed are you. Blessed are the people who are persecuted because of righteousness. Blessed are the people who, for making the right decisions, they are suffering. Blessed are the people who, when they make a right decision, it seems like all the bad people get all the good things and all the good people get nothing. Blessed are the people who are suffering because they constantly make a right choice, even though it's hard to make a right choice in the middle of all the crisis and the craziness that are going on to make a right choice. Blessed are the people, yet those people just don't feel blessed in the middle of all this. But Jesus says, blessed are those people because here's what they look like. It looks like they have a key in their hands. This key doesn't open the keys of a bank account. It doesn't open, uh, it doesn't open the doors to a beautiful house in this earth, but it opens the kingdom of heaven. They have a key in their hand that allows them to walk and shine. And as they open the gates of heaven, they can bring other people with themselves. Because they are making the right choices. They are making choices that bring honor and glory to the purpose of God. And it says this, blessed are you. Let me put this on for last one. Blessed are you when you are persecuted. Blessed are you when you people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, Jesus says. Look at these words. Let let me read this one more time for you because I don't, I want to make sure it sticks. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all, all kinds of evil against you because of me. Look at the next word, verse 12 says, rejoice and be glad. Are you joking me? Rejoice and be glad. They insult me. They make fun of me. They, they call me a traitor. They call me somebody who doesn't love other people for this reason or that reason. All because I want to do what Jesus commands me to do. Rejoice and be glad. Listen, if you've been sleeping this whole morning, I need you to wake up because what we are about to look at right now is the most important thing or part of this message. The next portion says, rejoice and be glad. I want to make sure you get this, okay? So we're going to read it until you do. It says, because great is your reward in heaven. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, listen to this, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I don't think you guys got it. Let's try this one more time. In the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I don't think you guys are getting it. Let's try this one more time. For in the same way, help me out with this, in the same way they persecuted the, the what, the what, the what, the what? In the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before who? In the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Listen to this. Jesus is saying that in the same way they persecuted prophets who were before you. In other words, none of you came to church this morning thinking you were a prophet. But you're going to leave out of this place knowing that you were called to be prophets of God. And some of you don't, are thinking, what is a prophet? Is somebody who knows the future? No, that's a fortune teller. A prophet is a person who knows the will of God, knows the will that God has decreed, and is a, is a person who stands in the gap, who says, you were enemies of God, but God has come with the birth of His Son to bring reconciliation. A prophet is a person who says, the end is near. God is coming back. And I am here to stand to tell you God loves you. That He sent His Son to die on the cross for you. He says, they're going to persecute you because that's what they did to prophets. And you are a prophet if you're a disciple. How many of you thought you were prophets? How many of you took that seriously? You see, the light is shining. It's beautiful. Some of us say, though, you know, I can be... I can be pure 
I can be pure in the spirit, maybe. I can be, um, uh, I, I can be poor in the spirit. I can be meek. I can, I, can, I can even endure the persecution and suffering that may come with it. I, I can do all that. But when it comes to, when it comes to looking at people but so they were creating the image of God, I'm not too sure about that one. I, yeah, they drive me crazy. The thing about it is some of you say, well, but that's not a big deal though. The light is still shining. Have you ever seen a Christmas decoration of a house that they have all the lights and then the portion is like not lit? It's horrible. <laughs> and God says, you are that light, but you can't take one out. Because the people will see your good deeds and they will glorify God. And you can't say, you know what, I can't just, I, 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 being humble is difficult for me on this point. Or, or maybe just depending on God for everything, that's a difficult thing. It's just one thing. What difference does it make? It makes a difference because the world sees the light missing. And you are called to be prophets. You are called to make a difference. You are called to make sure God's decoration is beautiful as he intended. That is what you're called to be. It's a lesson I want to finish this morning. I want to finish by reading this for us again. Some of you may wonder to yourself, let me just go through the whole thing verse by verse. We're going to read it again because we're going to get it. And we're going to walk out of this place as prophets. We're going to walk out of this place as people who proclaim that Jesus is coming. That to us a Savior is born. That He has died on the cross for our sins. We're going to walk out of this place knowing that we have a mission. That we must shine. That nothing is going to stop us to shine for the purpose of Christ. So if you wouldn't mind standing up for this. If the Spirit of God leads you to read this in your hearts with me, the verses will be on the screen. But as Jesus spoke to his disciples, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Listen, if the Spirit of God leads you this morning to come kneel before Him. Maybe some of you came here this morning you just knew you weren't humble enough before God. Maybe some of you came this morning because you had things to mourn about. Maybe some of you came here this morning because you are in the middle of choices that you just don't know how to make a righteous choice. Maybe some of you came here because you're angry and you just don't know how to be peacemakers. Whatever the circumstance, the maker of the heavens and the earth is calling on you this morning. And he's asking you to bow before him. He's asking you to look upon him, to become beggars who say, God, you are my only provision. To become those who ultimately inherit the kingdom of God. Spirit of God is calling you. Father, this morning I pray with my family here. 
God, I thank you for each and every one of them. Father, I thank you that every single one of them has been uniquely designed by you, made in your image, to represent the glory and the majesty that you have. God, I thank you that by looking at each one of them, I can be reminded that you love us, that you made us. God, I thank you that this morning we are reminded by your word that we are not expecting to have a glorious life here, but the glory awaits in heaven when there is no sorrow, where there is no pain, where there is only the glory and the majesty of our Savior. And our Jesus will be the sun who shines. Your throne would be at the center of your kingdom. And as your people, we get to laugh we get to have joy day after day with you. So, Father, I pray, whatever we brought in this morning with us, that we would leave it with you and that we would take the calling that you have for us to be prophets, to be proclaimers of the gospel of reconciliation. Seriously. The time is coming where you will come back in glory. And God, I pray that we would be ready for that. Father, bless us this week. In your holy name I pray.